Good morning, Messiah. Good morning. And good morning to all that are watching and looking on their devices this morning. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Because God has been good to us. And we need to pay homage to Him by worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. As we celebrate a portion of our Black History Month today, we're talking about a soldier that uh, was very heroic in his uh, defense of this country. So at this time, we're going to have a selection from our music ministry, followed by a scripture and prayer from our deacon, deaconess, and mothers.
Good morning, my brothers and sisters. So glad to see everyone here this morning. On this lovely Sunday, we are here to praise God this morning because he's been so good to us. He's been very good to us. And that's why we're here today because Without him, we would not be here. Will you please stand for the reading of the scripture? I'll be reading First Peter 2, 13 through 17. And it's from the New King James Version. It says, Therefore, Submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, according to his being us, to us, king as supreme, our two governors, are those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put your silence in ignorance of foolish men as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for advice, but as bond servants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. I just read you 1 Peter 2, 13 to 17. May God have a blessing to read it and the hearers and the doers of his holy and righteous word. You may be seated. It's prayer time now. It's prayer time. And our own Deaconess Simmons is going to take us to the throne of grace this morning. You see, uh, our spiritual communication to God is a two way. It's two way. We talk to Him, but we must also listen. Now, Sister Simmons is going to. Take us to the throne of grace, and she's going to take all of our concerns and our petition to him this morning, praying with her as she prayed for us. Good morning. Let us pray. With every eye closed and every head bowed in reverence for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heavenly Father, we come asking you to forgive us for all of our sins that we have committed, as only you can. And then, Lord, we come thanking you for allowing us to see this day, a day that you have set apart just for us. Not that we're so good, not that we've done all that you've asked us to do, but we thank you because it's because of your tender mercy. That each morning new, we get new mercies day by day. And we thank you for it, Lord. And then, Master, we say thank you that we got up this morning. We were cold and in our right mind. We thank you, Lord, that you gave us a mind to get dressed, to get in our vehicles and come to your house and worship. Where we can worship you in spirit and truth. But we can thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. For we are not worthy of anything, but because of your grace, we thank you, Lord. And Heavenly Father, we ask, oh Lord, we ask that you would just be with us. For Lord, we need you now as we've never needed you before. Lord, there's, Lord, oh Lord, there's wars and there's rumors of wars that you said it would be. Oh Heavenly Father, the Bible is being fulfilled today. And Heavenly Father, open up the minds and the hearts and the eyes of the people who cannot see that, that you are in control of this world. Oh, Lord, have mercy upon us. For we need it, Lord. We need it now more than ever. And Heavenly Father, we just thank you for allowing us to be here today because so many laid down last night that did not wake up this morning. So, Lord, we say thank you for one more day. One more day. 
to tell somebody about you. One more day to love each other like you said we should. One more day to be compassionate toward one another. Oh, Heavenly Father, just one more day we thank you for Because, Lord, all we have is today because tomorrow is not promised to us. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would touch the afflicted ones today, Lord, the ones who are sick. Oh, Lord, you know who they are. I'm not going to ask you to go anywhere because, Lord, you're already there. I'm just asking you for that touch. That one touch will make it all right. And Heavenly Father, for the ones who are lonely, sad, grieving, depressed, oh, Heavenly Father, touch them. Let them know that they need to lean on you, Lord. For, Lord, you have the answer to all of our problems, not man. Lord, we thank you. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to bless the one who's going to bring the word today. Let us receive that word, Lord. And not only to listen to it, to hear it, to receive it, but go out and spread the word to someone else for what we heard today. Oh, yeah. oh, Lord, we thank you for all that you have done. And Master, when our time and our mission on this earth is over, we ask that when we come into your kingdom that you will remember us, Lord. But Lord, we want to hear those special words that you will say to us. Well done. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. You've been you be faithful over a few things, but enter now into the master's joy. Oh, Heavenly Father, we can look to one side and we can see God, our creator. And Lord, when we look to the other side and see the one who saved us, we can bow down and give the highest praise of hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Master, until that day, we ask that you would incline your ear unto us and to grant us your precious peace. Oh, yeah. oh Lord, hear this service prayer. And I do pray it in the sweet and the precious name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. 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 That concludes our devotion this morning. We hope and pray that each and every one of you have a blessed day. Lord, we continue, continue to bless you throughout this day. At this time, I'm going to ask Sister Pamela Jones to call in to read briefly an account of one of the bravest soldiers that the United States has had in war. Good morning. Good morning. A brief history of African American Medal of Honor recipients. The Medal of Honor was created during the American Civil War and is the highest military decoration presented by the United States government to a member of its armed forces. Recipients must have distinguished themselves at the risk of their own life above and beyond the call of duty in action against an enemy of the United States. Because of the nature of this medal, it is commonly presented posthumously of the 3,470 3, medals of honor awarded as of June 2015. 92 have been awarded to 90 different African American recipients. Robert. Augusta Sweeney is one of the 19 men and the only African American to have been awarded two medals of honor. No African American was awarded a medal of honor either during World War II or immediately afterwards with respect to their actions during that conflict. This changed in 1992 when a study conducted by Shaw University and commissioned by the United States Department of Defense and the United States Army asserted that systematic racial discrimination had been presented in the criteria for awarding medals during the war. After an exhaustive review of files, the study recommended 
that several of the distinguished service crosses awarded to African Americans be upgraded to the Medal of Honor. On January 13, 1997, more than 50 years after the end of the war, President Bill Clinton awarded the medal to seven African American World War II veterans. Vernon Baker was the only living recipient, and the other six men had been killed in action or died in the intervening years. First Lieutenant Vernon Baker, extraordinary heroism in action on April 5th and 6th, 1945, near Biarrigo, Italy, then, then Second Lieutenant Baker demonstrated outstanding courage and leadership, <coughs> excuse me, in destroying enemy installation, personnel, and equipment during his company's attack <coughs> against a strongly entrenched enemy in mountainous terrain. When his company was stopped by <coughs> When his company was stopped by the concentration of fire from several machine gun emplacements, he crawled to one position and destroyed it, killing three Germans. Continuing forward, he attacked an enemy observation post and killed two occupants. <coughs> Excuse me. With the aid of one of his men, Lieutenant Baker attacked two more machine gun nests killing and wounding the four enemy soldiers occupying these positions. He then covered the evacuation of the wounded personnel of his company by occupying an exposed position and drawing the enemy's fire. On the following night, Lieutenant Baker voluntarily led a battalion advanced through enemy minefields and heavy fire toward the division objective. Second, Lieutenant Baker's fighting spirit and daring leadership were an inspiration to his men <coughs> and exemplifying the highest tradition of armed forces. Thank you. We have African-Americans who received the Christian Medal of Honor from all the wars except World War II. They didn't see anything at that time that warranted the Christian Medal of Honor being given to a black soldier. Uh, Bill Clinton, thank God, saw that it was systemic racism and he did something about it. So uh, if you want to read about the ones that got in the Civil War, there were a lot of blacks that got medals of honor in the Civil War, World War I and all of the other conflicts, except Vietnam, I, as I recall, there were none that received the congestion of honor from Vietnam. And when I look at some of these African-American soldiers that returned from Vietnam, they're suffering from the effects of Agent Orange and all these different cancers and all these different problems that they have and all of them uh, are being more or less mistreated by the VA administration when it comes to providing health care. And uh, Stuart and some of the others can probably tell you more about Vietnam than I can. I'm just reading from the books. But uh, we not only were discriminated against here in this country, but also protecting this country, we were still being discriminated against. So uh, we thank God for Mr. Baker and for his contribution to it. You know, they didn't have, they didn't integrate the military until I think it was in the uh, 50s when they integrated the military. So we had to black everything. All right. At this time, we're going to, uh, oh, as an announcement, uh, Deborah Bonichot's pastor and wanted she wanted to join his church in New York. But she wanted to leave here and go join Grace Baptist Church in Mount Vernon, New York. 
And uh, she told me that she wanted to go there and join the church. Well, as I told her then, uh, you don't have to go that far, I'll bring him here. And so Dr. W. Franklin Richardson will be here on the uh, 8th of March uh, to preach in the Western Baptist State Convention. And he will be at, uh, what's that church? What was it, Deborah? I don't know the name of the church. McCoy. McCoy Moore uh, over on, uh, I think it's 47th Street, 46th Street. Anyway, the address is in the office. And uh, my concern is, is that when my friend comes to town, if there will be anybody from there to hear him preach. So I'm asking the members of Messiah to go and support uh, that night, 7 o'clock. Uh, the women's activities that they were doing today, and Richardson will preach at night. And if you haven't heard him, you, you are in for an unusual experience, for he can really preach, and he preaches short. Uh, he won't be up in about 25 minutes. And so we, I want the church to support in that effort. He came to us. When he came to us uh, to preach the uh, revival, uh, we gave him uh, comparatively uh, little. Uh, he stayed at the Peninsula Hotel in Beverly Hills. He flew here uh, on Delta first class, and uh, we didn't have paid enough to cover. But like I told Delta, he's my friend. So he told me just to give him the budget and that he would pay the difference. So he actually paid to come here and preach. And so I thank God for the friendship that we have, and I had the occasion to preach twice at his church in Mount Vernon, New York, and he has three services, and they were packed, and I preached. So uh, I thank God for Dr. Richardson, and I'm asking the church to go that night and support. The van will go if we have enough people to drive the van over to McCoy, uh, Memorial Baptist Church. All right, this time, uh, do you have an announcement you want to make? Good morning, Good morning. This month is the month of February, so we have two things in this month. The 19th is our pastor's birthday. Amen. And on the 26th, which is the last Sunday in this month, has been set aside for our pastor and first lady's anniversary. It has been 25 years. Yeah. Sister Jones have, had, have been served us for 25 years. We have a lot to be thankful for for that. Yes. We, have, we do have a lot, but even more so because of this pandemic, we were able to stay together. And so we thank God for that. So on that day, I'm asking each and every one of you to come out and to support our pastor and first lady to show your love for the service they had done here for 25 years. And not only just to celebrate, celebrate Messiah. We are a family. And we have been together for 25 years under their leadership. And so on that Sunday, we're going to have a guest speaker. It's not good for him to, to preach on his own anniversary. So Dr. Wendell Davis will be doing the uh, preaching that day. Show your love. Don't uh, stay home if you don't have anything to give. Your permission. Please come and to support our pastor and our first lady. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, this time we're going to receive our offering.
then he realized and got a reply from heaven. And he was told, all my grace is sufficient for you. If you have enough grace, you don't need anything else. So even in the midst of trials, tri troubles, and tribulations, God's grace is sufficient. Gas can go to ten dollars a gallon. His gas, his grace is sufficient. Eggs can go to ten dollars a dozen. His grace is sufficient. We're going to eat. We're going to drive. We want to enjoy a quality of life, no matter what they do. We want to enjoy a quality of life because God has promised never to leave us, nor forsake us. And he's promised to always take care of us. And so we don't have to worry about it. God is going to provide for us. Abraham said, Jehovah Jireh, my provider. And if God is providing, he's all sufficient within himself. If you will rise and read with me Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. Genesis chapter 50. Verses 15 through 21. I will read the odd, we will read the even, we will read verse 21 together. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will adventure hate us, and he will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. Said the church. <laughs> So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass, the trespass of thy brother and their sin, for they did unto the evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servant of God, of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. Church. Amen. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am, for am I in the place of God. Church. For as you, ye have done evil against me, but God meant unto good, to bring the past, that it is this day, to say much to you alive. Read that again, please. He had nothing to do with his dreams. Uh, they came to him 
but yet they resented him when he told them what he had dreamed. I don't know, you can't some seemingly tell people you dream sometimes. You can't tell everybody your vision sometimes. Sometimes you just have to keep things to yourself. Even in your household, in your family, you just can't tell all that you plan to do at one time. Because people sometimes don't have the faith that you have, and they don't see the vision, they don't see the dream, and thus it brings about hostility in the family. Same thing in the church. If the pastor has a vision for the church, sometimes he meets resentment. Deacons have to have a vision of where the church go. They meet resentment. Trustees have a vision. They meet resentment. So sometimes people just resent uh, what's going on. If you take the political arena, uh, I contend that the Republicans don't even have an agenda. They wait on the Democrats to present something, and then they jump on the other side of it. And I don't care what it is, even now in Sacramento, they're bringing out the number uh, in Sacramento, and now they're fighting the, the program that the governor brought forth to present, to uh, eliminate the homeless, and provide for cleaning up the cities, and suppressing crime. The Republicans now, if you read the, I think one of the focuses, it's in there. The people don't want to go along with you. Some people resent things just to resent them. They, they, they don't really have a, an agenda themselves. They just don't want you to be the one and get the credit for what's going on. But I tell you, you can't tell people your dream all the time. Yeah. You can't let people know who your favorite is. Yeah. Everybody has a favorite, that's not necessarily but, uh, in the family, but most of us have a favorite outside of our household. You can't let people know who your favorite is, or they'll start picking on your favorite as well as you. You know, you got a favorite nephew, a favorite son, a favorite cousin, a favorite uncle. You, you can't let the rest of the uncles know uh, your favorite because they will uh, <laughs> turn on you too. The people in your family can hate you by, by being jealous of you. If, if I, I've said it over and over, if all of my family drove up here one Sunday morning driving Rolls Royces, you know what I'd say? Boy, the Lord has shown up blessing my family. And I'd get in my little Chevrolet truck and go about my business. I used to drive my truck to church, and one of the deacons told me, he said, Pastor, please don't drive your truck to church. He said, because uh, people will think we're not paying you. And so uh, I don't drive the truck to church anymore on a Sunday morning. But uh, it doesn't make any difference what you drive. It's what you're coming to do. And I'm coming to worship. I don't know what that's what you're coming to do. And if I can walk, I would walk. It doesn't bother me. I just want to be able to come in here and shout and worship God and tell the world about God. Well, well. Yeah. Your own family will plot against you. I sat and I looked at uh, families, in my family even, and uh, the matriarch and the patriarch both deceased, and they fought for 20 years or more over two old raggedy houses. And, and they, they broke up, they didn't speak to each other, they hated each other, they were in court. And I was in the middle of it, I buried two or three of them, my first cousins, and I tried to talk to them one-on-one, uh, -on -one. I tried to talk to them at funerals. They fought, they fought, and they fought, now none of them have anything. You can fight in your family and lose everything. Uh, I tell you all the time about divorce court. If you think that uh, you have it rough being in a relationship, get downtown and let that judge tell you what you are going to end up with. The judge is going to tell you, you if you are a man or a woman and, and you got a husband that doesn't work, you got a wife that doesn't work, he's going to tell you how much money to give her. He's going to tell you how to divide the furniture. It's going to be decided how everything is done. And that man hadn't done anything. He's going to tell you how much child support to pay. He's going to tell you when you can see your children. Now, now, that's going a little too far for me. You can see your children, you the father or the mother, and the other one is a custodial parent. He's going to tell you when you can see your children, every other weekend and every other summer. Uh, you can see them on Wednesdays at, from 6 to 10. Those are your children. Yeah. And here's a man sitting downtown telling you when you can see your children. He's going to tell you how much money to pay your children. He's going to tell you everything about your children. And this man doesn't even know you. 
because there is conflict in the family. We need to get that conflict out of the family. At all costs, get the conflict out of the family. If you've got to get a divorce, settle it among yourselves. You work for it. Yeah. Those lawyers are going to hit you for three and four hundred dollars an hour, and that's a cheap attorney. If you get an expensive attorney, you're going to pay him upward of five or six hundred dollars an hour. If he goes to court and get a continuance, you have paid him from the time he left his office until the time he gets back, and if he stops and has lunch, he bills you. He writes a letter, he bills you. He bills you for every telephone conversation. And you're fighting over the dog. You're fighting over a, a, a picture on the wall. You're, you're fighting over nothing. Uh, let me move along here. Bad intentions. I just don't want you to have it. I don't necessarily want it. I just don't want you to have it. Stupid. Just giving up all the money. And when you get through, all your money is gone. They tell you you got to sell your home. You got to move. All of these things. And nobody has worked for it except the two of you. And let me tell you, let the conflict in the family cease. Pray, for, pray with each other. Don't just jump up and go to the voice. Pray with each other. If there's a problem, pray about it together. If it's about money, pray about it. If the man is not bringing home enough money, you're bringing more money home than he is. Pray about it. Talk to him about it. If, she, if, if she's making more money, he's making more money, he's not paying the bills, she's not paying the bills, she's not pulling her loan, he's not pulling in. That's a mighty good reason to go to the divorce. Because somebody's not pulling that load. Right. Because you can get somebody to pay the big uh, carry the load. Yeah. A woman can get everything a man's got. <clears throat> Watch yourself, preacher. Sure. Uh, <laughs> amen, Pam. Uh, your own family will kill you if given the chance. If not physically, they your influence. Jealousy. Shakespeare says in a dog, he calls jealousy the green eyed monster. Your family is the closest thing to you. Children fighting against parents. Parents fighting against children. Children want, want to be uh, liberated. They, they, they want to be free from their parents. And so about 14, they take their parents to court so they can be free of that supervision. Uh, I don't know what a 14-year-old is going to do. He can't support himself. He can't even get a job legally. I don't know why they want to be liberated at 14, 15, 16. They don't even have a way of making a living. But some children are fighting their parents. Parents are fighting the children over nothing. If you want to see a real good fight, let a parent die, both parents die, and leave with just a couple of dollars in the bank, and you see a family come unmoved, unthrilled. It's, it's ridiculous. When, when, when you didn't work for anything, and you're fighting over everything. Yeah. Family mess. Joseph's status with his father was his father's doing. He had nothing to do with it. He didn't ask for the coat of many colors. He didn't ask to be his father's favorite. That was his father's decision. And father who made the decision, the other boys, the other 11 boys, they had their own. They were out tending sheep, they had everything. They were going to inherit everything. And so we need to understand that jealousy and fighting in the family, in the church, on the job, too many politics on the job. Too much politics, too much politics in the church. And then we take it home. We need to leave it alone. Joseph made one mistake by telling his brother his dream. Had he just dreamed it and waited for it to come to fruition, then that wouldn't have been as much of a problem as it was. But because he was young and much younger than they were, he's running around, I had a dream last night. I saw where uh, mama and dad and all of y'all fell down and y'all were begging me for something. They resented it. It's time sometimes to keep your dreams to yourself. That's young and mature. When you're mature, you sometimes just keep things to yourself. You're hurt by yourself. You're happy by yourself sometimes. Your brothers formed a conspiracy to kill Joseph. 
It was Reuben that stopped them. But one person st stepped up and said, no, let's not kill him. And they, he had enough influence in the family to stop the, the killing. But then they still wanted to get rid of him. When people want to get rid of you, they can find a way to get rid of you. And believe me, when I was moderator and I go in these churches where there was conflict between the pastor and the congregation, I've seen how churches come together. People that don't even like each other. People that didn't associate with each other. Like, like Pilate and Herod, they come together that day or that night and they, they form this coalition and they vote the pastor out. I don't know why a pastor would sit there and wait on them to pull him out. <laughs> he just ought to pack his stuff up and know when people don't want him. You know, and so I've seen them vote out several pastors of these uh, high profile churches because they didn't want him. And I'm here to tell you that when you have problems in the church, it affects the entire community. It just doesn't stay in this particular church because if something goes down in Messiah this morning, it will be all over the church community by three o'clock because people love mess. People like talking about mess. And so even here, the brothers all intended to kill the boy because of his dreams and because of his relationship with his father. And then instead, they put him in a pit, put him in a pit, and then they sold him. Uh, they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know God's plan for this young man. And so they sold him for 20 pieces of silver. And then they got him down into Egypt and sold him to Potiphar. Potiphar. And when they sold him to Potiphar, he went in and he gradually moved up to being the head of the household. Responsible. He had the responsibility of taking care of everything in the household. But Satan is a very subtle individual, a soul, or whatever you want to call that rascal. Uh, as part of his wife looked at this young man. Now, in most situations, when a young man comes into the household, he's usually a eunuch. Apparently, Joseph was not a eunuch because he had two children later on. So we find that this woman looked at this young man and she tried to get him to do something that was against his uh, religion, something against his morality, something against everything that he stood for. And when he resisted her, then she made up a story because his coat was there. Part of what comes home, and I know how he must have felt, man, I brought you here, I brought you, and I let you go up to hell in my household and everything, and now you're messing with my wife when I'm not home, and all this kind of stuff. Put him in prison. Putting him in prison was just where the Lord wanted him. He sat there in that prison with the baker and, 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 and some other dealing with, uh, individual. And then Pharaoh had a dream that needed uh, interpreting. And Joseph was able to go in and interpret the dream of the Pharaoh. And Pharaoh promoted him, I've got to rush, Pharaoh promoted him to the second in command in the land of Egypt. The Lord moves in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. There's no way that a Jew should have gone up that high in a Gentile political arena. But God had a plan. And so when Pharaoh's dream came, he had seven years of fat and seven years of lean. Joseph told him, you're going to suffer. So get everything in order now, build your barns, your silos and everything, and get everything in order. Because there's going to be seven years that you won't have anything. And so it was followed. And he became the second in command, wearing the Senate ring, wearing the robes, wearing all of the attire, and he was the man. Meantime, in the land of Canaan, there's a family. And here, Joseph's family is suffering. His brothers, their family, his father, all of them are suffering. So he said, well, there is plenty of grain and plenty of food in Egypt. Let's go down to Egypt and let's see if we can buy some. When they come in, they don't recognize Joseph, but Joseph recognizes them. And to make a long story short, eventually the family has to move to Egypt. They are given some of the prime land of Egypt in Goshen, and they brought their cattle and everything went well. They multiplied, they multiplied greatly 
in the land of Egypt. They prospered in the land of Egypt. But then it is said that a Pharaoh came to power that knew not Joseph, nor what Joseph had done. And he put them in the servitude. When I hear people say that they were enslaved for 430 years, that's not correct. They weren't enslaved when they first got there. We don't know exactly how long they were enslaved, but toward the end, they were enslaved. Joseph has enough faith to say, God is surely going to visit this place. When he visits this place, I want you to take my bones and take it and bury it in the land of Canaan. God used Joseph to help his people to, just as Jesus did. The resurrection of Joseph was when they put him in the pit and took him out, the resurrection. He was sold like Jesus. Jesus was 30 pieces of silver. God, Joseph was with 20 pieces of silver. When you look at how he delivered his people, God delivers us. And so as a result, he parallels Jesus. I don't have enough time to go into it. But he parallels Jesus on so many theological points that you would, would be amazed at how much Joseph re, 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 uh, resembles Jesus in his ministry. My brothers and sisters, these brothers had bad intentions. They had bad intentions. But then it turned on them. Their own motives, their own methods of doing things turned on them. And then when, when Jacob died, they wanted to know, is Joseph going to get revenge on us for what we did? That conscience will own them because, you know, you go talk to him. No, you go talk to him. No, let's get somebody else to go talk to him. They didn't have the decency uh, to go to him and ask him, do you intend to do anything to us now that daddy is dead? Joseph, when, they, when the man comes to him and asks him the question that he was asked to go to Joseph and ask, Joseph began to cry because he was so hurt because they should have come to him. He had already told them, I am not going to do anything against you. I forgive you. They didn't believe him. And then when he tells them, I'll take care of you and I'll take care of your families. Don't worry about it. Because your intentions were bad, don't mean that I'm going to seek revenge. People judge other people by what they would do under the same circumstances. If, if that man had, if, that, if they had done to some of us what they did to Joseph and the way he was mistreated and the things he suffered, the imprisonment and all that he went through, and then here comes your cousins and your brothers and your sisters coming in and saying, can you help us out? Many of us would turn our backs and walk away because we want to seek revenge. Not so with Joseph. Joseph says, no, I'm not going to take, to take anything from you. I'm going to continue to feed you. I'm going to continue to take care of your families. Brothers, bad intentions sometimes make you want to crawl. God has a way of turning things against you. You can fight today and win, but you won't win all the time. Right will always right. win. I don't care how the battle goes, right will always win in the end. You want to lose some battles when you stand. People are going to talk about you when you stand. People are going to dislike you when you stand. People are going to plot against you when you stand. But let me tell you, stand anyway. The Bible says when you've done all that you can do, stand. Joseph stood as a man, as a man of God. He stood. Temptation was there. He stood. We've got to learn to stand and not become a solid majority. We need to stand and tell the world, God will work it out. I don't care what you're going through. God will work it out. He has promised never to leave you and never forsake you. And Joseph's, the narrative dealing with Joseph explains to us that God has kept his promises from Genesis to today. God is not going to leave us. He's not going to forsake us. Enemies may come. Hard times may come, but God is going to deliver us from everything. Enemies are going to win sometimes, but I'm going to tell you that in the end, right will win. Stay right. Get a prayer light. Keep a prayer light. Do like Joseph. When you're faced with the opportunity to hurt an enemy, smile at him. He says, turn the other cheek. Pray for them that despitefully use you. 
Yeah. Don't try to get revenge. He says, vengeance is mine, said the Lord. Yeah. If you let him get the revenge, sometimes he'll strike your enemy down so quickly and so hard that you even have to worry about it. <laughs> God will fight for you. Yeah. If you ask David, David said, my enemies came upon me to eat of my flesh, and they stumbled and fell. Yeah. Let me tell you something. Your enemies cannot win when no. you're right. When you got a good dose of the Holy Ghost and a prayer life, yeah. your enemies can't do you no harm. He can talk about you and still can't hurt you. He can take things from you and still not hurt you. For God that I serve yeah, yeah. is always with the right side. Yeah. He's never lost a battle. He's never lost a case. Let me tell you, bad intentions, don't worry about those with bad intentions because the Lord will work it out.